from the nation's capital, the Conservative Caucus presents Conservative Roundtable. Welcome to Conservative Roundtable. I'm Howard Phillips, chairman of the Conservative Caucus, which sponsors Conservative Roundtable. I'm delighted that we have as our guest for this broadcast the vice chairman of the Conservative Caucus, who's also the vice president of the Conservative Caucus Foundation, my friend and colleague Charles Orndorff, a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of the University of Virginia. And I say, I say this when he's not here. I don't know anyone in America who is a better student of the Constitution of the United States and its history than Charles Orndorff. He really knows his stuff when it comes to the proceedings of the state ratification conventions, the Philadelphia Convention, uh, the part played by the various uh, leaders in the early days of the Republic. And uh, uh, recently I've been doing a narration of an analysis of the Constitution, which uh, Charles has prepared. And I have to say there's no one on the Supreme Court who wouldn't benefit from studying what uh, Charles has written. But tonight we're going to talk about uh, something that, in my view, is very dangerous. And that is the proposed balanced budget amendment. Now, d does that mean I'm against a balanced budget? No, but it does mean that I'm against uh, the balanced budget amendment. But l let me begin our discussion, Charles, with the question, has deficit spending always been normal for the U.S. government? No, as a matter of fact, if you look at the history under the Constitution from its beginnings in 1789 up through 1929, the normal thing was that during peacetime, the federal government would run a surplus. There would be deficits during wartime. There would be deficits during depressions. And then the rest of the time, we ran surpluses in order to pay down that debt. And in fact, Andrew Jackson, during his presidency, paid off the national debt. And the, uh, the debt following the war between the states was, all, was about two-thirds paid during the next 25-some years uh, before another big depression came along. So that was what we, we had up until 1929. And then 1930 was really a watershed year because the, what happened after that with first the Depression and then World War II, uh, that really changed the way the federal government operated and the way people looked at the federal government. Uh, you had all these programs, beginning with Herbert Hoover, with his bailouts of the banks and corporations. So he was not the great conservative by any oh, means. Not, not, it was, he was very liberal. Yeah. Her, most historians now recognize that the New Deal had its origins in the Hoover administration. Oh. Roosevelt came along then after criticizing Hoover <laughs> for those policies and adopted them and expanded them. Yeah. I remember going to the Hoover Presidential Library in Iowa, and that very openly and uh, specifically... Uh, made clear to every observer that this guy was no conservative. Yeah. I mean, he, you could look at, at his policies. They're almost identical to those of President Obama. Huge deficits, big increases in spending, <coughs> stimulus programs. He, he was someone who had been advocating a stimulus throughout the 1920s as the uh, Secretary of Commerce under Harding and Coolidge. And so he was the one who first started the idea of the government as being there to help people out. Franklin Roosevelt obviously came in after him and expanded it still further. He added the, the relief programs and so forth. And then you had World War II, which also uh, played its part in terms of the, uh, uh, the things like the GI Bill. And the result of all these various subsidy programs was to completely change the way that most Americans looked at the federal government. They began to see the government as one source of financial support for themselves. And that has been the case ever since. And ever since that took place, deficits, even in peacetime, even during prosperity, have been normal. What we have are people who want to expect the government to provide them with various types of programs, but they also don't want to have their taxes raised to, uh, to pay for it. If we look at the tax system we have now, it's true that the, the tiny minority who are very wealthy or well, even well-to-do pay most of the income taxes. And uh, the middle class uh, pays uh, the rest of it, and the, the lower class pays virtually nothing. Uh, and for most of them, in fact, they do not do pay nothing. Uh, but that's because the middle class has the votes. When they say, no, you're not going to raise our taxes, even Obama listens uh, and says, okay, I Tax won't. the other guy. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, he's, he's willing, he, he doesn't mind taxing 1% or 2% at the very top, uh, although it's interesting that people do seem to be uh, wising up to the fact that once you start ta raising taxes on the top earners, it's not long before they start finding ways to raise taxes on people further down. It's, well, we did this, and it didn't work, we didn't balance the budget, so let's raise taxes on everybody else too. Charles, today there is growing concern about the multi-trillion dollar deficits facing our country. Was there a similar concern in the late 20s and early 30s? There certainly was concern, um, and there were a number of people who were working, trying to, uh, to push to bring spending under control. Uh, that might have happened after the 1938 elections when a conservative coalition gained control of Congress, uh, uh, Republicans plus conservative Democrats. But, of course, World War II came along immediately after that, and the deficits became even larger. But after World War II, when Republicans uh, briefly regained control of both houses, 1946. Right. Uh, the result was they cut spending, they cut taxes, and they uh, laid the groundwork for a period of economic growth and budgets that were sometimes in deficit, but not by nearly as much as we have now. To what extent has popular pressure added to deficit spending? That's the real, the real cause of it, and that, and I mean, it is, it is the people saying, "Give us benefits, or at least don't take away the benefits we have now, but don't raise our taxes either." And that's why that, you really have to take that into account when you're looking at something like the balanced budget. Will it work? It won't work if you leave uh, any possibility for the politicians to continue doing what's gotten them elected so far. Well, that moves us into what I really want to discuss, and that is the wisdom or folly of the proposed balanced budget amendment. Now, uh, many very fine people have signed on to it, but I think it's a horrible idea. What's your view on it? Yeah, I, it, I understand why they support it. At one time, I did too, until I had to, really had to look at it and figure out what it would do, uh, how, how it would or wouldn't work. And uh, it, yes, they, they certainly like the idea that, the idea behind it is that if only we put it in the Constitution, then certainly that will make it happen. It'll have to be done. Well. Uh, as we're going to discuss here, that's not the case. Uh, for one thing, as long as you've got that uh, uh, situation where popular pressure encourages politicians to spend but not tax, you're going to have deficits. And the balanced budget amendments that have been proposed really can't get around that. There's, there's several problems. One is all of these amendments, everyone that I've ever seen introduced, has loopholes. Uh, one specific loophole that's almost always there is during time of war we can run a deficit. Well, you know, you think about it, we've been in a perpetual state of, and it's undeclared wars as well as declared, we've been in a perpetual state of undeclared war since 1950. The Korean War is still going on. There's a ceasefire, but it's still going on. And of course, after Korea, we also had Vietnam, then we had the Gulf War, and so forth. Uh, the Gulf War, we had a 12-year ceasefire from 2001, or 1991 to 2003. We're, we're always in an undeclared war, it seems like. We have three of them going on now. And you know, that, that's a huge loophole for Congress. But, but it, it's not just that. These plans all, every one that I have ever seen, includes a general loophole that if Congress, by some supermajority, maybe two-thirds, maybe three-fifths, can just for whatever reason Congress feels is good enough, go ahead and set this aside. And when you look at the political pressure on members of Congress, it seems to me it's a lot easier to get three-fifths or two-thirds to suspend the balanced budget amendment than it is to get a majority to vote to really cut spending and go home and tell the people, hey, I cut your Medicare, I cut your agricultural subsidies, I cut your uh, 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 transportation spending, you're not going to get that extra lane on the highway to help you get to work faster. That's, that's really tough for them to do. Well, what uh, concerns me most about all of the proposed balanced budget amendments is that it, it makes the president, rather than the Congress, the principal legislative authority. It could have that effect. It depends on how they would handle the enforcement. Uh, none of them that I have seen specifically give the president that authority to just go out and cut spending on his own. But uh, it's clear that if you, if you don't have any other enforcement mechanism in there, it implies that the president is supposed and to take And it gives him action. the lead role in proposing 
yeah. uh, levels of spending. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, and we have to be quick because we've got to go to a break, is that it gives extraordinary power to the judiciary. Yeah. Tell us how it's, it does that. Okay. Well, uh, the problem we have there is that, and in one of the proposed amendments by Senator Mike Lee, it's explicit. Uh, He's the new senator. The new senator from Utah, and a very good one. Yeah. Uh, just, you know, again, a problem with on this. Uh, his, his amendment uh, says that uh, members of Congress can go to the courts to try to get this enforced. Well, you know, if you put it in the courts, there's all sorts of problems. To begin with, what makes judges especially talented and, and skilled when it comes to balancing a budget? Who, wh why are they considered to be better uh, able to do it than members of Congress? I'd say it's just the opposite. That they don't know nearly what congressmen do in term when it comes to setting priorities. And also they've been involved in... Uh, improperly trying to raise taxes in some cases. That, that certain judges have, yes, yeah. some, some, some of the federal judges. You've got the problem that uh, also that could take a long time. I mean, look at, look at the, the suits that have been filed concerning health care. Uh, it's been more than a year now. And, and there are conflicting the opinions. Yet. Conflicting right. opinions. What happens if you can't get five justices to agree on a plan? You still have nothing. Yep. Yeah. Uh, at the Supreme Court level. You could go on for a couple of years and still get nothing out of it. So, yeah, Supreme, going to the courts is just a terrible yeah. idea, but it gets down to the fact that, yeah, how do you enforce this? If you're yeah. gonna, there's got to be some method, and there really isn't. Charles, we're going to have to uh, take a break. We'll have more to say on this topic when we return. Please stay with us for more uh, commentary by Charles Orndorff, America's leading constitutional expert. Stay with us. You are a defender of liberty. You spoke out. You were heard in Congress. No. You marched. You created a new movement. You endured attacks. You see folks waving tea bags around. Now you can help to repeal the bill. Go to SendThemAMessage.com. Print the pledge to repeal Obamacare. Send it to your representative, senators, and candidates to sign that they pledge to repeal the bill. 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 Now. Go to SendThemAMessage.com and help. Repeal the bill. Hello, I'm Steve Forbes, chairman of Forbes Media, here to tell you, urge you, to watch Conservative Roundtable if you want to learn about the issues that matter and what you can do to get our country back on the right track. Welcome back. I'm Howard Phillips, and I'm here with constitutional scholar and expert, my friend and colleague, Charles Orndorff. And we've been talking about the balanced budget amendment. What are some of the enforcement problems with the amendment? Well, let me give you a historical example. We know that the Constitution already says that every 10 years, Congress must take a census, look at those census numbers by state, and then reapportion the members of the House according to that census. That, that's clear. It's black and white. Nobody denies that it's there. Nobody has, has ever been able to reinterpret that to mean something else. But in 1920, when a lot of the more rural states were going to lose a significant number of states to uh, those states, or but seats to states that had urban areas, the rural states simply refused to do it. They just never reapportioned throughout the 1920s. Uh, the census was totally ignored. Uh, the Constitution clearly said they had to, but nobody could force Congress to do it. A balanced budget amendment would be much the same. I mean, imagine uh, the kind of games that they could play. For one thing, each house could pass what it claims is a balanced budget, but defeat the balanced budget passed by the other house. And, of course, the, uh, when they're talking about a balanced budget amendment, they're talking about not hard numbers, but estimates. Exactly. There's all sorts of things you can do with that. Uh, you can uh, say that you can have a, a very ridiculous economic uh, 
uh, estimate, which gives you lots of tax revenue and cuts back on some of your spending programs uh, that are tied to uh, unemployment, things like that. And you say, okay, we've got the, ba the budget balance when you know it's not. Well, who can uh, step in and say, no, you're wrong, and force them to something? We already talked about the fact that courts can't do that. Yeah, what would a balanced budget amendment have as an effect on Social Security? Uh, no, no effect on Social Security or anything else, really, that much, as far as I can tell. Uh, now, I will say that one thing, we, you may recall back in the 90s, we were very concerned when the balanced budget was seriously being pushed then that it might lead to tax increases, that the liberals might simply use it as an excuse to raise taxes. And I have to give the people who are introducing these amendments now credit because they have looked at that possibility and they have, I think all of them, have some kind of supermajority requirement for raising taxes. So that problem at least is close to being taken care of. It would be very tough to raise taxes, but defense is a different matter. I think defense is one area where if they were playing games to try to keep, uh, uh, to, to preserve uh, uh, some kind of, of credibility, they might genuinely cut defense while keeping other handout programs in place. In my view, the best way to cut defense is to avoid intervention in places uh, where our intervention does not relate to the defense of the population and territory of the United States. We would save a lot of money if we were not in Afghanistan, if we hadn't gone into Iraq, and we're going to lose a lot of money in Libya. Certainly that's been, uh, uh, for the past several years now, a huge uh, uh, matter in the federal budget. Uh, the Bush administration tried to hide it, sort of, by not putting it in their budgets and handling it as emergency legislation. I'm glad to see that not only has Obama changed that, but that the House Republicans now are talking about changing the law to prevent anyone in the future from being able to do that. They would have to be up front and put it in their budget numbers. Of course, again, they'll estimate it wrong uh, if they really are determined to, do, uh, to hide it somehow, or uh, at least to minimize it. But uh, you know, there's some room for improvement Some there. people are arguing in favor of a constitutional convention saying it's just too hard to get all of these individual amendments passed by a majority vote in Congress and three-fourths of the states. So let's have a convention to do it. What's your view of that? Well, we have no way of knowing what a convention like that would uh, come up with. My guess is that any, any convention called would, of course, not have a James Madison. It would not have a James Wilson and so forth. Uh, it would come up with uh, uh, probably amendments that would be so off the wall that the states would refuse to ratify them. We'd no, be no better off than we are now. If there are Even, people remaining in the states who have uh, constitutional character. I th we've seen in the past with things like Equal Rights Amendment and the, uh, the D.C. Voting Amendment that so far, at least at, at that point, the, the states were more sensible than Congress. Uh, I, th I think that's still the case now. Uh, we're seeing in some states, for example, uh, where they've taken on the, uh, the public employee unions. Uh, so I think that the, on the whole, the states are still safer in terms of trusting them with the Constitution than certainly than a Constitution convention would be. How close uh, was the Constitution to failing because of opposition to the states? Oh, very close. Uh, in fact, if it hadn't been for uh, the, the turning point really was your home state of Massachusetts. That was the first time that the Federalists came up against a state where a majority of the convention, as elected, was hostile to ratification. And it was in the debate there they came up with the idea of, all right, how about would you agree to ratify the Constitution but recommend amendments that you think are necessary? And that won over just barely enough votes. And that then was followed in other states, including Virginia. Uh, but if, if Massachusetts had voted no, it would not have happened. And even in Virginia, uh, it was just ten, or really, really, if, if four members had shifted their position uh, on a key vote, uh, that would have been enough to kill it in Virginia. Of course, the anti-federalists certainly had a pretty good point. They understood that uh, there were problems uh, with any uh, grant of power to the federal government. The federalists understood, and they said this repeatedly in the convention in Philadelphia, all power is subject to abuse. The important thing is to give the federal government all the power it needs but no more and then trust the people to watch over that government because if the people themselves are ever corrupted then it's hopeless anyway. Well they didn't do a very good job 
<laughs> of controlling the judiciary, uh, first of all, in Marbury versus Madison, and the whole idea of judicial review was something I think even Hamilton warned against it. Well, no, actually, they, they, during the convention, most of the members said they were in favor of some form of judicial review in order to, to enforce the Constitution. Right. But uh, it was certainly true, even Madison himself, interestingly, uh, when, he, when the whole idea of, a, uh, uh, of the, the federal government or of the, the Supreme Court striking down a federal law said, well, I had in mind them striking down state laws, but yeah. this is a little different. But it was Madison himself who was one of the people behind the first appeal to the federal courts to strike yeah. down a federal law, a tax law. Yeah. J James Marshall uh, had an effect on our system of government, which endures even today. He did. Uh, and on the one and he hand, was a delegate from Virginia, the ratifying The, the Virginia ratifying. Yeah. And in fact, he, uh, uh, he talked about how the, the states could count on the Supreme Court to protect uh, them from the federal government. And uh, instead, he very much pushed a nationalistic agenda, sometimes in accordance with the Constitution and sometimes stretching it uh, uh, way beyond what most of them had expected. And of course, there was the big uh, dispute between Adams and Jefferson during the presidential transition period as to whether or not Jefferson would honor mm -hmm. judicial appointments made by Adams. Right, and even the ones that already had their commissions delivered, Jefferson took care of that by having the bill that created those positions repealed, and that was that. Uh, even the Supreme Court backed him up on, uh, on that particular uh, item. Um, you know, going back to the, the balanced budget, I think what, the fact is what these politicians they need to do is not to waste time talking about an amendment which, at best, if it had an effect, would be three or four years or five yeah. years down the road. They need to get to work balancing the budget now. I'm encouraged when... Uh, Not by raising taxes, but by right. cutting spending. Right. Uh, uh, back in March, when I first started uh, uh, writing about the balanced budget amendment, uh, uh, one of the concerns I had was there just didn't seem to be any serious movement towards cutting enough spending. I, I noticed that at that point, even the Republican Study Committee, which is supposed to be the most conservative Republicans in the House, was putting forth budget proposals which wouldn't come close to balancing the budget. And what we've seen since then is a huge change. We've seen the uh, House Budget Committee come yeah. forth with a bill which, although it has a lot of question marks yeah. in it, uh, at least lays the groundwork for serious spending Paul cuts. Ryan deserves high praise. He does. For his courageous and articulate leadership. Yeah, he's being criticized very, very harshly. Now, I have to say, I have some criticisms, too. I think there's some very questionable assumptions, and the fact that he doesn't but balance it until 2040, uh, even with those assumptions, is, is not what I like. But I'm even more impressed by the fact the Republican Study yeah. Committee has come out with one that balances it in nine right. years. Charles, uh, we're going to come back, and you'll have the last word, but we've got to take a break now. Please stay with us, and uh, the last couple of minutes of this program will be devoted to... Uh, some articulate the insights by Charles Orndorff, who in my view is America's leading constitutional scholar. Stay with us. Hey, listen. This is the greatest thing. I want to tell you something. Something's happening in this country. And I want to tell you, look, at, look around my friends here. My friends here in Washington, come over here. See all these great people? <laughs> these great folks are here because they want to take the country back to the direction of the Founding Fathers and stop all this nonsense that's going on and stop this, uh, you know, this uh, immersion into socialism which is happening. We've got to stop it. And every day we're losing a little bit of our freedom. But the, the answer is that the, the, that the individual citizens can make a difference. They can walk through these houses of Congress. They can look, at, look their congressmen in the eye and say, hey, vote this bill down. Get rid of it. we got a lot of work to do. And the, the first thing we have to do is get rid of the garbage and the attacks on our freedoms. This is it. So anyway, that's what these guys are doing here today yeah. to do. Yeah. And, uh, and I say, all of you guys out there, where it was the sound of my voice and the, and the you know, the visual that you're cre that this great gentleman has created, get down here and do your do your uh, 
responsible citizenship by going and seeing your representatives and telling them, you know, what you want, because this is, this is your house. It's not their house. Yeah. Get in there and tell them what to do, and let's, uh, let's begin cleaning this country up. A, a big yes. mess has been created in only a year's time, in nine months' time, really. A big mess we have to recover from. We've got to start work. We've got to throw some people out. So anyway, I love this country. I love you. Go do your job. Thank you. Welcome back. I'm Howard Phillips, chairman of the Conservative Caucus, which sponsors Conservative Roundtable. You can watch our programs on YouTube, or you may live in a community where it's broadcast. And uh, we're very fortunate that uh, the Conservative Caucus has been doing this for many, many years. If you're interested in learning more about the issues we discuss on Roundtable, our website is www.conservativeusa.org. Uh, our fax is... Uh, uh, 703-281-4108. With no cost or obligation, send us your contact info, and we'll send you information on any topic of interest to you. And, of course, as I've indicated, our distinguished guest this evening is really runs the Conservative Caucus. He is the vice chairman of the caucus, the vice president of the foundation. We have uh, about a minute left. And, uh, Charles, what are your last words about the balanced budget amendment? Well, there's been talk about trying to put the balanced budget amendment into the debt limit, which I think would be a waste of time for all the reasons we've talked about. The key thing for the debt limit, the key concession they need to get, is real spending caps. And there does seem to be a sincere interest on the Republican side in doing that, putting in some kind of lim permanent limit on spending that would be enforceable. That's what we have to watch for. Another thing they'll be trying to do, I hope, is to adjust the amount of the increase so that... Obama will have to either cut spending to match what they want for this year or come back again next year. Charles, you've been a great guest. Thanks for watching the program. See you next time.